good evening and welcome to this uh, meeting uh, to talk about and discuss the ideas uh, for which Narendra Dabolkar uh, was working and perhaps for which he was killed. Uh, we all know that uh, Narendra Dabolkar is a well-known rationalist, activist uh, in that cause, brought out a regular uh, publication and as you would have gathered from the media reports, had also been pioneering and pushing for a bill uh, in the Maharashtra legislature uh, which would uh, regulate uh, activities which could be regarded as superstition, pursuit of black magic uh, and other such uh, categories which uh, Dabolkar wanted to uh, push for. Uh, when uh, Sudanva and others thought of this meeting and discussed it with me, uh, we thought that uh, it would be far better not to organize a meeting just as a condolence or remembrance uh, of Dabolkar, but uh, to perhaps seriously throw light on and discuss some of the ideas that he uh, represented, that he worked for. And if we also look around at the kind of, uh, the sense of outrage that we have seen in the media on Dabolkar's uh, murder, uh, perhaps reflect on that uh, as well. Uh, given the composition of our panel uh, and where I come from, which is the people science uh, movement, uh, I think it would be fair to say that there are streams of thought uh, like the rationalist movement, like the people science movement, like the progressive movement represented here in the May Day Cafe, which are not exactly uh, coterminous with each other, which don't overlap with each other a hundred percent. Uh, which perhaps even differ with each other in some significant uh, ways. And uh, I hope that these speakers uh, would also each in their own way uh, reflect on what the rationalist movement or the rationalist ideology, if you like, uh, conveys, especially in relation to other such uh, movements, systems of thought, progressive thinking and movements and explore some of these interrelationships because it seems to me that the kind of audience that we have here with us today in the May Day Cafe which perhaps uh, appreciate uh, such a wider uh, discussion. Uh, I don't think I will say too much more uh, in introduction and I don't want to stand between you and the speakers. Maybe if I have a chance uh, and I'm inclined towards that. I may chip in with a few remarks uh, towards the end. So may I uh, now call upon Professor Romila Thapar uh, to initiate the discussion with her remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say at the outset that I would like to go a little further afield and try and look at the, the atmosphere in which we're living today, which I think has something to do with anti-rationalism. Uh, when I say this, what I mean is that I think a lot of this comes out of what we very readily call the mindset. And therefore, I think it's necessary to also look at how the mindset has come about and what is, what is it that is creating the kinds of attitudes that, that lead to uh, anti-rationalism and, and, and uh, an attitude which encourages the opposite. Let me begin by saying that my remarks are rooted in my present feelings about where we are in this country, in our society, 
and they come out of a very deep depression. I think that it's very difficult for me at least to rise out of this and be optimistic because what is really going on is something that I have not experienced before and something that I had not thought would ever hit us. This degree of corruption in every aspect of life. And I think, let me begin by saying the obvious, that I think the kinds of corruption that we're into are eroding a lot of the values that we have stood for in the past. Many of our politicians are corrupt, yet we look up to them. Uh, we get to know about their corruption, we gasp, and that's where it stops. Uh, money talks, money talks everywhere. And there's no way in which we can stop that. And it affects social ethics. And if it affects social ethics as well, then I think at a certain level it begins to affect the way in which one thinks. Is one really thinking in terms of analyzing a situation? Or is one only thinking in terms of what to do in this situation? And I think that's one of the problems that we face when we talk about the need for rational analysis. We may make a rational analysis. How do we proceed then to make that analysis something that would make some change, some dent in the society that in, the, in which we are living? There is, in fact, a disguise, a kind of veneer. Uh, we have a constitution, we have parliament, we have institutions, and they all seem to be somehow doing some functioning. That's the apparent image that one gets. But then when you look beyond this disguise, beyond the veneer, at seeing how they're functioning, you begin to realize that what is happening is two things in the main, uh, it seems to me. One is that you have a political economy of black money, uh, where the only thing that matters is money, the only thing that matters is making that money. Now, you can rationalize that, certainly, that in this society of uncertainty and competitiveness, one has to make money in order to get on. But the other side of the story is that do we have to have a society like this where it is necessary uh, to make money in order to, to get on? The other thing that is absolutely appalling is the degree of abdication. That is that what I mean by this is that everybody seems to have decided to abdicate from what they have to do and their responsibility. It comes as a huge surprise if you suddenly meet somebody, either a workman or someone in administration, it's very difficult to make this comment about politicians today, but people who are responsible and who will respond to a need for a job of work to be done without the usual kind of pattern of this is the salary I'm getting, but never mind about my salary. What, what is the money that you're going to give me to bribe me to do work? So this double payment that goes on does have an effect on social ethics. And it does create a mindset in which you do not dare to do a rational analysis. You do not dare to see the ills of society in a scientific way, because you know perfectly well what the alternative is, what the answer is, and you're not willing to do it. Society and social behavior is pushing you in a way, and you are pushing society in a way, in which any kind of really serious analysis is not something uh, that is, is going to help. Now, in the midst of all this, and possibly also related to this, you have an exponential growth of communalism, which is very, very apparent from many things. Um, 
and not only in one religion, in every religion. That is partly the frightening thing, that in every religion today, you have the growth of a communal position. Now, what do I mean by a communal position? Basically, it's a position in which you so organize your religious interests that you can use them for political mobilization. And you begin to see your, your identity as a religious community as essentially a community that is concerned with political mobilization. Now here again, it's a case of do you apply any kind of rational yardstick to understand what the communalism means, what political mobilization means, and why it, it is being brought about. There are demands to defend religion. This goes on all the time. And one wonders, to defend religion against what? Religion today is dominant. It is really much more to the point to say to defend those who are trying to be analytical about religion, who are trying to expose what is not religious being passed off as something religious. Um, and what happens with this defense of religion that you always get the lumpen elements being brought to the forefront for whom there is only one approach, which is if you're not with us, you're against us, and therefore we will abuse you, we will threaten you, and if necessary, we will kill you. So if that is a defense of religion, so be it. We must come to terms with this as a defense of something uh, that we seem to be concerned with. The argument of hurt sentiments, for example, which is taken to ridiculous extremes, with the banning of books, the, the censoring of films, uh, with large-scale public attacks on libraries, on people who think, people who express themselves artistically. Uh, all of this is there in the name of hurt sentiments. Do we question this? Do we go to the point of saying, who are you representing and whose sentiments are hurt in what you claim to be a demonstration of hurt sentiments? And the question that I ask myself then out of this really very depressed feeling about the situation is that how did we get to this stage? There is a point at which even rational analysis and scientific analysis has to go back a little bit into history and ask, why is it that this society has got into this kind of situation? There was a time when there was a premium on the scientific temper, on rational analysis, a time when there was a national movement, for example, that was a movement that was inclusive it brought everybody in. The enemy was outside. The enemy was the colonial power. And we constituted everybody else, all Indians who were fighting this enemy. And this continued until 1947. 1947 did bring something which was a setback, namely that it was a solution based on the religion of the community being given political mileage. And that was a very negative feature of what happened in the partition. But it happened, and we all thought at that point, or some of us at least, that this will pass, and that we will go back to a position when we think of ourselves as a totality, as an inclusive whole, as a society that is moving towards something that is rational making, uh, that will allow us to develop as a, um, a progressive, rational society. But this, of course, didn't happen. Um, and I'm beginning to wonder that maybe it is that nations remain united as long as they are colonized. Once the colonial power is removed, then they break up into smaller groups. And the pattern in the South Asian subcontinent seems to have been 
that they break up into religious groups. You take Pakistan, the maximum disharmony is among different sects of Islam, whether it's the Shias and the Sunnis, uh, whether it is the sub-nationalism of Sindh and Baluchistan after the great sub-nationalism that, went, that, uh, that was manifested in Bangladesh, whether it is Sri Lanka, where again it is the Buddhists against the Hindu channels, whether it is now Myanmar, also under British colonialism, where it is now the Buddhists against the Muslims. So one begins to see a certain pattern in the way in which ex-colonies, when they stop being colonies, start expressing themselves, finding an enemy within themselves. And this, to me, seems to be the most dangerous aspect of what we're doing. We're finding enemies within our society. The old idea of the enemy being outside has gone. And so we're looking around at all the minority communities, and the majority community is picking on who is going to be its enemy in which situation. And obviously, the minority with the largest number becomes the enemy. Why is re religion defining a community? Is there absolutely no way in which we can move away from this? This is where, of course, the scientific temper and rationalism does come into importance. That one has to argue that a community has certain commitments, it has a certain makeup, which is a makeup of the human rights that go with the rights of the citizen. Uh, the human rights of social welfare, of social justice, of access to education, to health, and so on. These are not the issues around which communities are being built today. And these are the issues to which I think we must turn some way or other. How we do it, I don't know for sure. But you know, one can make some suggestions as to uh, how this should be done. Um, you have, therefore, in this process of organizing religion for political mobilization, you have the reformulation of religion. I mean, one of the noticeable things that's going on today is that we are not going into religion as it was practiced 100 years ago, any of the religions. We are reformulating the religions, or not when I say we, I mean really the communal elements uh, who are working on religion. So Hinduism is becoming Hindutva. Islam is becoming Islamization. And the same process is going on with other religions. There is extreme religiosity coming in. Everybody is now running around wearing Maori dhadas, monga rings, tavises, holding bruts, going in for hovels. And the frightening thing is that even those of us who are fundamentally rationalists, when our friends do this, we don't say to them, no, I will not come to your heaven, because I think it is irrational. We go along quietly. We don't make a noise about it. But I think if we were to make a noise, don't go, but explain why you're not going. I think that that might make people think a little bit about whether what they're doing is religion or whether it is superstition. And I think that distinction is extremely important and it's a distinction we often confuse. We think of religion not as this individual, emotional, psychological feeling of support that we need. We always think of it as a community getting together, organizing ourselves to get more access to corrupt politicians, more access to money, and that kind of thing. And this is where I think that distinction is extremely important. I think one of the reasons why we um, are particularly violent and intolerant is partly that we keep kidding ourselves. We keep believing this myth mythology about Indian culture being totally non-violent and tolerant in the past. This is a complete myth, because 
Indian society, like every society, every pre-modern society or modern society in the world, has been intolerant, has been violent. And one of the most fundamental issues of intolerance, for example, is the fact that for hundreds of years, we have created in our society a substantial group of people whom we have suppressed and subordinated and said they are so wretched that we cannot even touch them. This is fundamentally inhumane. This is utterly inhumane. Whatever justifications you may bring for this, labor, the, the need to have people to cultivate your fields, the need to have people to do your artisanal work and so on, that may be. But fundamentally, it is an inhuman attitude. And we must give much more attention to this and not imagine that we are a society uh, that was given to non-violence and tolerance. I won't give you historical examples of violence, religious violence at that, religious groups fighting each other. Uh, but if you need the, the, the examples, I can, I can certainly give them to you afterwards. Um, so this, I think, is something that is extremely important in terms of understanding what really the, the, the constituents of our society and of our civilization have been. There have been very magnificent developments. Interestingly, the most important developments in the past that took place in this country, apart from perhaps philosophy, but linked to philosophy, was technology. We have tremendous developments in mathematics, astronomy, medicine, and so on. Those are not the ones that we pride ourselves on these days, except in a ridiculous fashion when people run around saying we should go back to Vedic mathematics, which makes no sense. Uh, but we should take pride in the fact that we were once a society that gave a lot of status and respect and gave a lot of intellectual interest to people who were into these disciplines and into the philosophy of understanding how knowledge is to be analyzed, examined, and used. That doesn't seem to come to the fore very much uh, these days. Let me briefly now conclude by saying a few things about where I think that people who have a sense of of, of a scientific attitude, a sense of the basic, fundamentally rational behavior of human society, how they can intervene. The mindset has to be changed, but this is not easy. How do you change the mindset? Um, the mindset has to be changed because the entire rape and corruption of our society today arises out of a warped mindset, which we seem to be developing in this day and age. We have not had it in the past, but it seems to be getting worse and worse day by day. We must give some attention to this. Um, how do we proceed? We proceed, for example, through educational channels. You look at the textbooks that children use in schools. You look at teacher training in schools. You look also at, for example, the very, the most influential single item these days, the media. What is being shown on the media? Is it possible for us to agitate that perhaps in addition to all these channels that have these advertisements, some of which are absolutely socially quite objectionable, but nevertheless get accepted. But in addition to all this, we might have media channels that project a rational education. That we have talks, we have discussions, uh, we have a reaching out to school children and to school teachers. Because I think this is one area of life which is absolutely crucial. And if you've got the technology, if you've got media to do this, please, why can't we influence some of the media channels? Uh, for example, I think that we should make a demand that in every major media channel, at least, 
there should be half an hour given over to discussions with young people. After all, there's all this hype these days that the next election is going to be an election of the young people. Their ideas are going to count. Their loyalties to politics, whatever that may be, will count. Why don't we bring them out and discuss, have them discuss it? They may take very conservative positions, but there may be others who will be there to counter those positions and say, no, we don't accept them. But let there be discussion. And let there be discussion amongst the young people, which I think is particularly important if we're going to go on emphasizing the fact uh, that it is going to be uh, an election in which the young are going to play a very major part. Similarly with something like internet, which I gather is perhaps even more influential than the media. Uh, someone said to me the other day, no one's reading these days, but this was a comment based on the fact that books don't sell so much. And when I quoted this, I was immediately corrected by a group of young people who said, what nonsense, we read as much as your generation read, it's just that we read on the screen. Now, if you look at the internet, you open up any of these websites and start looking at them. The amount of nonsense that comes out, fundamentalism of the worst kind that resorts to every single religious fundamentalism you can think of, um, programs of obscure thinking, which are encouraged with all kinds of garrets dangled about you will get this, you will get that, if you follow this, if you follow that, and so on. A lot of superstition that goes on on the internet. Is there no way in which one can at least present a counter view? Does this mean having to set up websites? Or does it mean that we can intervene where there is an existing website that is propagating something which is essentially irrational, given to superstition, has no basis. Is there no way in which one can intervene? I don't know. I'm not an internet user. But I gather that there are many websites where they say, this statement is incomplete, it needs completing. That's the point at which one stops, steps in and says it needs completing because it needs the other side to also be sure that you don't just look at what is irrational and try and project that, but you also present a rational point of view. That is one possibility. Then we come to the much more direct interventions, perhaps. Um, the judiciary. I'm amazed that it's now going to be almost nine months since there was that rape case in Delhi. We have some of the suspects. We seem to go nowhere. Every other day, every other week, there's a <coughs> photograph of this juvenile with his head covered who's taken in and out of uh, the Patiala House High Court. Are we proceeding with this? Are we getting anywhere? Are we doing something? Similarly now with this case in Bombay, should we not agitate that there has to be a time that on these sorts of cases, the fast track only makes sense if there is an absolute time limit, that this case comes up, and irrespective of what is happening on other issues, these issues have to be decided. Because otherwise, nobody takes this seriously. The laws are expendable, because you can buy your way through. You can buy your way by bribing the police, by bribing the administration, by bribing up and down the line. So are we going to continue with this situation where even the basics of how a society should function, should function like a sensible, organized society, even these are completely thrown aside. And once again, I think that it's very necessary that we invest, a, invest the possibilities of all, of all of this. We can't change the police system overnight. We can't change the administrative service overnight. We can't change anything overnight. But we can at least try and set up an alternative scenario and argue and say to people that you have 
this being presented to you, but there is an alternative to what is being presented, which takes another form. And the reason why I say this, and end up again by saying that I suffer from extreme depression these days when I look around me at what's happening, is because everybody is predicting that between now and 2014, there is going to be greater violence, greater intolerance. So I think we do need to give it very, very deep thought.